there. So it is end of day four. Yeah, four. I I skipped a day because like there's just a lot going on. Um, so it's end of day four and um, I'm doing a lot better than I was. Um, most of the pain is kind of centralized in two locations. Um, it's otherwise uh, kind of like deep in like the abdomen area like really low or it's really really high up in my shoulders where the gas is um it's it's really not a pleasant experience either like that's definitely not something that they really prepare you for and like even just talking in the um the endo groups about it I really wasn't prepared for it um people mention the gas being a problem they mention that you know uh, that they put like air and gas into the abdomen in order to be able to see better and people mentioned at one point that like you know, you're kind of tipped with your head down so it you know it kind of like settles down into the chest somebody had mentioned that but no one not a single freaking person mentioned that it gets down into your shoulders so I was very significantly unprepared for that fun and I'm still feeling it and it's still excruciating and I still hate it and when you go to expel gas like through a burp and everything you know you should not feel it all the way in your shoulders it's not that's not normal that's really not normal um but I just have to write it out now wait until all of it gets out and feels better but right now it it's kind of in the like stage where like logically you know it's not permanent but anxiety wise it feels like it's going to be permanent and like it's never going to go away so like that's kind of the stage I'm in right now. My husband says I have a new belly button. So I mean I suppose that that makes sense uh, given the fact that uh, the, the biggest incision was in the belly button because that's where they placed the camera and then like the two on the sides like one on the left side one on the right side it's just like it um uh is meant for like the tools that they use to move things around to move the uterus and to uh extract the endometriomas out so um I guess it looks a bit different now. I, when I was looking at it, did not, I, I didn't notice it. Um, but both, uh, both, uh, Koi and Ash have both said that, yes, it looks, it looks distinctly different. Um, so. I guess that's just the new normal and uh, it will just keep being the new normal if you know however many times I have to have the surgery like throughout my life because you know there's no cure this is uh, one of their best treatments for it because they can go in and they can take everything out so you can have like a few years um, with it being fairly pain free uh, but it depends on the person uh, some people have had it start to come back after a few months <sighs> it's 
so you should not feel that in your shoulders. You just shouldn't. You shouldn't. You should feel it in your like chest and in your abdomen, and it, your shoulders should not be part of it. Ugh. So, I'm generally, like, not the type of person who likes to, uh, show my pain face to people if I can help it. But for the, uh, for, um, the realness of this video and, you know, allowing myself to be a little more vulnerable with an audience. Um, I guess I'm gonna put that to the side a bit. Um, it's, uh, day five and I don't know whether I just did too much yesterday or I didn't do a good enough job watching like my pain pill schedule. Um, I had been like mostly taking the 600 Motrin or trying to. I took that this morning before we went to my son's school and I was doing okay. But then I woke up and um I just I didn't think about taking anything at the time. And I went to take a shower and like I kind of knew right before I got in the shower that I probably should take something. But I made the really stupid choice not to. It wasn't one of my better choices. Um, when I got out of the shower, I was in really horrible shape. Like, everything in my abdomen hurts right now. And my shoulders kind of hurt, but it's not as bad as it has been lately. And it's radiating. The pain is, is radiating down my legs. And some of it's radiating down the, the arms a bit. And it's... I don't really know what to do with it right now. I've taken something for it. Um, the uh, Motrin hasn't been helping. Um, so I waited enough time and I'm trying the um, oxycodone acetaminophen. Um, if this doesn't help, I don't, I don't really know what to do. Um, usually when it starts getting this bad, when it, it starts getting to the point that like even laying down is excruciating, like you start talking about like, is it time to, to go to the ER? And like, I'm, I've kind of come to the uh thought process that it's never time for me personally to go to the ER like I'm all for other people like going to the ER that's fine like you know if it's really bad that they should they should do what their body is telling them to do but as far as I go um my insurance company has decided that you know basically nothing is an emergency anymore so, 
it's extremely likely that, you know, if I go to the ER, they'll be like, well, this wasn't an emergency. I don't even know why you went to the ER. We're not paying a single cent. And then, you know, we're back to, to fighting them over it. And I, I don't know if I have the strength for it right now. But I also don't know, like, if this keeps up for a few hours, what else I can do. And I'm also really nervous because going to the ER is such a crapshoot. Because you go in there and they're like, oh, well, you're a drug seeker. You just want medication. It's like, not really. I don't. Like, I don't even want to be on, like, any opioids if I can help it. Like, I will fucking well take just the stupid Motrin if I can freaking help it. Like, most of the time that's what I ask them for as far as, like, some of the take-home stuff. Um, because, you know, that actually works, and I'm so tired of them treating me like I'm some drug-seeking addict when really I'm a chronic pain patient that is shaking and crying, and the doctors just look at me like, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Like, it's so, it's such a messed up system. Like, these doctors don't even care about their patients. It's so rare to find ones that actually care, especially about us. Like, you know, go in with, like, your bones sticking out, and, yeah, then they'll probably care. Maybe, if you find the right one. But, like, you know, go in for something like we have, like, they don't give a shit. Like, it doesn't even matter. They don't care for anything. Like, they're just kind of like, well, I don't know what you want us to do. And they don't want to do any sort of testing. They don't want to see to make sure everything's okay. They don't want to, um, they don't want to give you anything for it. They don't want to, like, stop you from going into shock. They just look at you like, you know, you're there to get medications because you're an addict. And it's so frustrating because, like, ev all of the... Of all of the chronic pain patients that I have known, only one person has been an addict. And, like, I don't even think that the, the pain is what turned her into it. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of the hopelessness behind it and the mental illness that was left untreated and the then the way she was treated afterwards that led to it and then led to her suicide and you know it Sorry. <sighs> they really want us to be strong and handle this and sometimes it feels like you don't have any more strength left. And every time it starts getting this bad I, like, logically, I know that it's temporary, but in my head, I wonder how am I gonna, how am I gonna survive another, another episode like this? And we have so many people, not just pain patients, but endo sufferers, people with endometriosis who, who die otherwise from their pain or because they can't take it anymore and they think that this is 
all their life is going to be is moments like this. And they can't do it anymore. And I'm not going to let myself become one of those statistics. But... Oh my gods, if it isn't really hard sometimes. Now I have to wait to see what the meds do. And see whether or not, like, we'll end up in some sort of ER tonight going, help me. I don't really know what to do if if that's where it leads to. I mean, I know which ER we're, we, we're going to have to go to because certain Akron ERs I will not step foot in anymore because of how they treat me. I don't know. I'm going to probably get some laughs for this because this jerk right here is already laughing. But apparently, glue is an adhesive. See, I say this not because it's some, like weird revelation or anything, but because you see, I have the, uh, yeah, the incisions here, and if you see that little red, round, like, puffiness, I'm allergic to adhesives. It never occurred to me that glue was an adhesive. I just thought, oh, I just thought, oh, okay, so they put glue on. That's better than tape or something. Or, you know. No. No, it's not better than tape. <laughs> it's not better than tape at all. Because it itches, and it hurts, and it burns. And I don't like it anymore, and I want it off my body right now. But I won't see her for, like, another week like a little over a week and so there's not a whole lot I can do and I'm really pissed off right now and I peeled off a little bit of it as I said he's really amused right now really amused I peeled off a little bit of it because I wanted to see okay is it that I'm itching because it's healing, or am I itching because this is a reaction? Nope, it's a friggin' adhesive, and I'm allergic to it. This sucks. Well, today is Monday, May 27th, so it's Memorial Day. We're over at my father-in-law's house. Um, this is kind of in the backyard area of the house. We're kind of over at the pavilion, um, so that the son and his aunt can play on the playground area. Um, it's been exactly a week since the surgery. Um, this was like the first day that I felt well enough to, like, attempt any, like, makeup stuff um and I mean like you know it's the type of occasion that I would put makeup on um so you know 
I don't think I did horrible with it. Um, I sat down for it, which is a, a change because I actually cleaned off the, uh, um, the vanity area in the bathroom before the surgery so that I could sit down. Um, I haven't taken any uh, pain meds today. I don't think. I don't think I have. Um, I definitely haven't taken the oxycodone in a few days. Um, that's kind of, at this point, it's just kind of as a for an emergency type of thing. And uh, the 600 Motrin, which is what I've been taking most of the time now, um, I haven't taken that at all today. Um, and it's been kind of up and down. It's mostly been good. Uh, I've been getting some, most of the pain's been in the side ones. Although right now, standing here, I'm getting a little bit right in the belly button. And it's not a pleasant feeling. It's not like overly painful. It's just not pleasant. It kind of like is like this kind of like pressure pain right behind, like right underneath and behind the belly button. But um, other than that, it's been a pretty good day. Um, been having fun. Uh, joked around with uh, the husband and the boyfriend. And uh, <laughs> um, something that might turn into its own video. You'll see later. Um, and uh, dance to some queen music. And, you know, I mean, not like jumping up and down dancing. Like, mostly sitting and like... But, you know. And and doing pretty well. Like, you know. But that's, I mean, that's exactly a week. And I ha still have like another week and a day before I see the surgeon again for the post-op. Um, so, I guess we'll see. Hi. So, I'm exactly two days away from my post-op appointment, but two days ago, my uh, period started. So this is the first period post-op, and it's been different? I don't know. It's, um, it's been painful. But it hasn't been as painful, I think. I haven't been using the uh, Tramadol as much as I was before. Um, so, I think I've used like ibuprofen more than the Tramadol. Um, I've had a lot of back pain. Uh, part of that, I think, comes from uh, doing a lot of walking on Friday, too. I think that exacerbated it a lot. Uh, I was already having back and hip pain, though, uh, before that happened. Um, so I'm not sure. I think I just, like, made it worse. Um, and, uh, like, it started out really light, like it likes to do. Like, my period does this thing where, like, it kind of starts spotting. And then, like, for... Sometimes it'll do it for, like a few days to like four or five days like it'll spot and then it'll kind of stop and then all of a sudden like the real period's there well it was kind of like spotting the first day and then it was like kind of slow the second and then today i woke up and it was just like hello i have arrived <laughs> so um but I haven't taken any tramadol today, so, and I haven't really, the only pain medicine I've taken is ibuprofen, and that's for the back, so, I'd say that's a good thing, um, but it is like the, the first period post-op, and the first period post-op can be pretty bad, um, I've heard, so, I don't know. It's hard to say whether, like, the next one will be different or not. Like, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, but, yeah, on Tuesday I have my post-op appointment, so 
then I'll get to hear like all of it. She'll tell me like exactly what she found and, and exactly what she thinks about everything. So I guess we'll find out. <laughs> So it's like 1.17 a.m. Basically everybody else is asleep. Um, but I went to the bathroom before I was going to go and grab my pills, which I still haven't done, so I need to go and do that. Um, and uh, the glue was bothering me again. <laughs> so, um... I wouldn't suggest that you do. L listen to my words. Do what I say and not what I do. <laughs> because it's it's not a good idea to to pick off the glue for your incisions. Um, it it's continued to drive me crazy because I would I would end up peeling some of it away. And then the itching would stop for a while, for like a day or two, and then it would start back up. And I don't know if it was like, you know, it was there and it was just the Lyrica was numbing things down enough that I wasn't feeling it, but once it had kind of like built back up again, like then I could really feel it and it was driving me nuts again. Um, so like I would go and check and you know more would would have already peeled up so I would kind of you know break that those parts off and throw them away and uh now I just don't have any glue <laughs> I haven't even seen the doctor yet and uh that's I mean it it looks like it's pretty well healed um nothing it looks open um, it looks like the skin has definitely healed closed. Um, it feels a little weird on the right hand side. Um, at one point when I was, uh, standing and kind of like, one of the ways I moved, I don't know, it, feel, it felt a little weird, but maybe it's just like feeling it without the glue is just an odd sensation. But, um... I definitely shouldn't have been picking at it, and I know that. <laughs> I should have just called the doctor and been like, Hi, I'm having a reaction. Could you prescribe something like steroids or something like that? <laughs> because that's usually what they have to do for this. Because um, someone was saying like you could use like a cortisone cream. Um, but I have a feeling like unless it was really gonna seep through I don't I don't know how much it would help um because the itching was definitely under the glue like where the glue was stuck to the skin um so I don't know how much the cream would have helped without pulling it up more um so you know they could have prescribed like a steroid to stop the itching while um, you know, we waited for me to see the doctor and everything, and I, I probably could have done that by calling the surgeon, or I probably could have done that by talking to my, you know, general practitioner, but, uh, I have this really bad habit of, like, not wanting to make problems <laughs> when it's just myself, like, you know, oh, I'm having a bad time right now, oh, well, I could probably get through it, I don't need to bother anybody, that's, you know... When I first found out that I was allergic to um, adhesives, uh, I had a halter monitor, which you have an um, electrode sticky here and you have an electrode sticky down here. And uh, I think it took it getting to a point where like um, all around where the electrodes were, like it was, it was, the skin was broken open and bleeding and I was pretty at my wits end before I finally like called the number um 
that went to the halter monitor to be like, hi, this is driving me nuts. Can you please send hypoallergenic ones? Because I don't think I can do this anymore. And uh, their answer was, we don't have hypoallergenic ones, but we do have pediatric ones, which will work the same. <sighs> which were like, like the, the actual ones were like, about a bit as like a little less like about the size of my palm the the pediatric ones were, <laughs> were like all of this size or so so that was a pretty significant difference I think uh, I think it was kind of a short-sighted of them not to make adult hypoallergenic ones and if they're still not making adult hypoallergenic ones that's very short-sighted, but it took me t until it was really bad before I called up and kind of made a nuisance of myself. And um, so I think it was similar here. I the idea of using a phone didn't sound great to me. I was like, oh. I don't know I'd have to call them I don't I don't think I need to do that yet <laughs> I think it's fine I think I'll just you know I'll just I'll just I'll just break off a little bit of it it'll be okay it won't be a big deal it's fine and well now here we are there's no glue and I get to explain on Tuesday why that is <laughs> although I found out through through my friend Jess um, because she she's about to go into surgery soon that um, Dr. Billow said that uh, she's only had one patient in all of her years of doing this that's ever had a reaction to the glue. Well, Dr. Billow, hi, I'm patient number two. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> so, hi again. It has been exactly three weeks since the surgery now. Um, it's June 10th, so and it's a Monday, so exactly three weeks. Um, you know, we saw the, the doctor last week, and she said that the testing on the endometriosis that she took out from behind the, the uterus was kind of inconclusive, but she also said that the a lot of the testing for that can be a little weird and that just because it's inconclusive doesn't mean that it's not endometriosis. So she's pretty sure it is. Um, so that's how we're going ahead with planning on treating. Um, you know, normally treatment involves birth control, hormones, um, because there's no uh, known cure for it. Um, and you basically just have to treat symptoms, which sucks, um, but since we're trying to get pregnant right now, uh, going on any hormones is not a good idea, so right now we're just going to kind of leave it be, hope that, we're going to hope that the surgery did what we needed to do for right now, and then I'll kind of see how my pain is as we go forward. And hopefully I'll get pregnant. Sometimes pregnancy, while you're pregnant, like you end up um, in kind of a remission state, uh, but it's not something that lasts. Uh, there are some doctors that believe that if you get pregnant it cures endo, but that's not true. And if you ever see a doctor that tells you that, find a new doctor. Um, it can go away during pregnancy, um, partly because the hormones are different, partly because you're not having periods, like the lining isn't being changed in any way, like you're, the lining is being actually being used, so like, um, but some women during pregnancy have a lot of pain. Um, I, I had a lot of pain in my back and stuff, um, but I didn't have like uterine pain. Um, but the uterine pain was so much worse after I gave birth, and that can be a pretty typical reaction to endometriosis. So, it, you know, most of what I'm taking away from this is that, you know, 
I knew that something wasn't right. And I got told that this is just normal. You know, period pain is normal. Don't worry about it. Take some ibuprofen. It's not a big deal. And when, you know, scans like the ultrasounds came up and there was nothing um, in it, like, the doctors ignoring me really discouraged me. And I gave up trying to get help. It was the same. It was the same with the pelvic pain. It was the same with the pelvic pain. I kind of just like gave up trying because nobody was willing to help me. Like whenever I would talk to my doctor about it because I was so upset about it and so concerned, they wouldn't do anything. In fact, they didn't even take it seriously, and so I just left it alone until like mom found a an article in this I think it was a Suma health little magazine or something like that it was one of the little health magazines she saw an article about a doctor that was specifically dealing with pelvic pain the kind that I had been living with and mom was like we need to make an appointment for you like immediately and this time around when the pain started getting so bad I had someone in my group my chosen family who has endometriosis so when she was hearing it she was like this sounds like endometriosis and you need to look into it and so when I was getting some attitudes from like one of the physician assistants going like well we didn't see anything in your ultrasound and like I told her okay but you can't see that in an ultrasound and she was like well you know the endometrial lining looked fine and it's like you can't see this in an ultrasound and like even she wasn't listening and like I think without like the support that I have now without Jess being like don't frickin listen to her and without like the endo groups that I was in going like no like make sure you demand a surgical consult because the ultrasound won't show you anything CT scans won't show you anything nothing else other than the surgery is gonna show you and give you a diagnosis it's the only way and I think without that I probably I might have gotten discouraged again I might have given up and it's tragic. It's tragic. There are so many women who go through the same thing. They have this pain, they have these symptoms, they have all of these problems going on with their bodies that they can't explain and doctors brush them off and so they get discouraged and they just give up. And it's, it's a real problem in our healthcare system and it's not just in the US. Like, this, this isn't solely a US problem. I mean, it is a huge issue in the US, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's, it's an issue worldwide. Uh, we have women in all areas, in the UK, in Australia, in South Africa, in um, some of the Asian countries, uh, like Japan and China and Korea and all of that. Um, we have women in Canada not getting answers. We have women in uh, South America not getting answers. Like, getting, it's this overall same treatment for all patients. All of these women with endo having the same issues with doctors not taking it seriously, not understanding what endo is, not understanding what treatments are, for it and what the pain is and that it's not curable and doctors just brushing the whole thing off because well it's a women's issue and like you know we can fight for we can advocate for ourselves as patients and that's what we have to do and it, this has been a big learning experience over time of being an advocate for myself 
in the healthcare realm and being willing to argue with a doctor and being willing to walk out and tell them when they're being like really awful people um and but like you know and we can advocate out in the streets and doing you know protests doing you know things like that and making art and you know trying to talk to congress people about it and that's great it's great for us as patients to be advocating for ourselves and for the health you know health community to make this better for us but i don't think we can do it alone i don't think the solution to solving it is patients doing this alone doctors need to be advocating for us doctors who understand what endo is what chronic pain is and the types of of treatment that we go through in doctors offices and er's and hospitals they need to be advocating for us too and especially in an area where it's a women's health thing like for the uterus men need to be advocating for us too I would say that if you're going through this, if you're going through pain that's not explainable to you um, and your doctors aren't listening, never be afraid to find a second opinion. Don't be afraid to go farther to see a specialist. Find groups, find support groups online, on Facebook on um you know on any of the social media sites that, that you might be a part of find your support groups and try to find the specialists and the people that know a lot about the conditions and aren't just going to brush you off um there are some women in the no groups that have driven like three hours for a specialist and honestly like if I had to, I would have. And I know that not everyone can. And I get that. But fight. Like, fight for yourself. You have to advocate for yourself. And definitely, like, use your support system as best you can. And if your support system isn't supporting you, maybe they're not the best support system. And I definitely think that it can be hard to support someone who is dealing with so much, but there are support groups for people like this. Like, Koi went and joined a few that were specifically for partners and spouses of uh, people with endo. And, um... You know, whether that's a, a, you know, a woman or a trans man or a man with endo. Because, you know, it's not, it's not just a woman's problem. It's just, in a lot of our countries, they're viewed as women's problems. Um, but it's an overall health problem that, you know... There are support groups for this on all sides and there are ways to learn how to be more supportive to your partner and th things that you shouldn't say and better ways to help them so if you're a partner of someone going through this like definitely look into things like that um, it can relieve a lot of stress to have people that understand and that can give you tips for ways to help your partner and sometimes just asking what do you need me to do can do a lot it's a new diagnosis on top of a bunch of diagnoses and that's tough it's not the end of the world but it's tough it's another disease that's incurable that's chronic with chronic pain and it uh basically like sticks another little 
thing of red tape around me and ERs and stuff. And that's, I think that's where I need to learn how to handle myself and advocate better is in situations like that now. Um, but I mean, you know, this is me. I've, I'm a disabled woman with a lot of chronic pain and a lot of disorders. I have fibromyalgia. I have chronic migraines. I have depression. I have anxiety disorders. I have a heart condition called POTS, which is a tachycardia issue. I have endometriosis. I have anemia. <laughs> and it it's changed my life significantly. It's changed the course of my life of what I plan to do and expected to do, but I think if I can make some good out of it, that's important to me. Taking the crap position I've been handed and making something good from it, helping others, and finding my kind of niche area that just fulfills me. I'm going to be doing a ton of other things on this channel that's not just health related. I'm going to be doing cooking and baking things, I'm going to be doing DIYs and just, you know, showing general life as a disabled pagan mom. <laughs> and it's going to be fun, And but I'm also going to talk about health stuff, so, um, you know. So if you want to see all of the fun stuff, subscribe. If you want to talk, see the health stuff the vlogs of that, like, subscribe too. Um, if you just want to, you know, I'm just gonna try to have fun with it. That's important to me. And uh, I will see you next time. It'll be more fun next time. It won't be quite as heavy of a topic, I promise, but see you then.